going broke. So what do I do? Win the Mille Milla, Enzo, or you are out of business. A thousand miles across bad roads with sheep and dogs, anything can happen. We have to win the Mille Milla, then orders for sports cars will follow. Everyone's eye will be on it. Only one team will win. Make sure it's you. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Horsepower Heritage. I'm Maurice Merrick, and greetings to all of you listening from places like Palisades Park, New Jersey, Alpena, Michigan, Boulder, Colorado, Hanau, Germany, Brescia, Italy, and Balladrine, Ireland. Thanks for joining me for the last episode of 2023, and I hope that you and yours have had a wonderful year, and I wish you all the best for 2024. And it's been quite a year for me and for the show. And I just want to share a few highlights with you. So many great guests and opportunities have come along this year, like Kevin and Lucas Zinger of Zinger Vehicles, you know, visiting their factory and seeing the absolute cutting edge of the technology they're creating. That was incredible. Another great one, talking with author Peter Grimsdale about his book, Racing in the Dark, which is about Bentley at Le Mans in the 1920s. You know, that's a century of automotive history right there between Zinger and Bentley. So I feel really fortunate to bring you these stories. I also got the chance this fall to be in the broadcast booth at the Velocity Invitational at Sonoma Raceway with Jonathan Green, who is a veteran motorsports broadcaster, and he's covered MotoGP, Formula One, IndyCar, all sorts of stuff. He's a real pro. So it was great to be able to spend some time on the mic with him and give some commentary during the vintage races at Sonoma. Velocity Invitational is a great event, by the way, and some people are calling it the American version of the Goodwood Revival. It's on a smaller scale, but it's getting bigger every year. So if you get a chance to attend, I highly recommend it. But I think the highlight of the year for me was interviewing the great Emerson Fittipaldi live on stage at the Quail during Monterey Car Week just an unforgettable experience. And I definitely plan to do more live events like that in the future. It was so much fun. And through it all, so many new friends. And I'm always learning and thinking about what's next for the show, the promise of things to come. So thank you for another great year. I can't do it without your support. Please tell your friends about the show. And if you can contribute monetarily, please do. Just go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash HP Heritage. You can give as little as $2 or a larger amount. And if you want, you can even make it a monthly contribution. Now, I don't foresee a time when I'm going to make Horsepower Heritage subscription based. That's not really what I want to do. But if you enjoy the show and you can support my work, it would be a big help. All right, let's talk about today's episode. One of the most anticipated movies of the year is Ferrari directed by Michael Mann, and it opens in the U.S. on Christmas Day. It's the story of a pivotal time in the life of Enzo Ferrari. He's facing personal and professional turmoil, trying to keep his family and his company together while winning races. And the backdrop of the story is the 1957 Mille Miglia, the legendary thousand-mile Italian road race. And my guest today was responsible for bringing the racing action to life. Robert Nagel is a veteran Hollywood stunt coordinator and driver. In 2015, along with his colleague Alan Paddleford, he won an Academy Award for Technical Achievement for a self-propelled high-speed camera platform called The Biscuit Jr., and you'll hear more about that in a little while. You've seen his work in films like Talladega Nights, Baby Driver, John Wick, Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, Gran Turismo, and, of course, Ford v. Ferrari also known as Le Mans 66. And that list barely scratches the surface of his credits. Robert is the first Academy Award winner I've had on the show, so that's pretty cool. So this was a fun one for me. And since I had the chance to sit down with Robert in person, I wanted to get the whole thing on video, which meant I needed an authentic period competition Ferrari to set the scene just right. So I made a few calls, and we met in an undisclosed location, surrounded not just by Ferraris, but a whole host of incredible classics. And the full episode will be up on the Horsepower Heritage YouTube channel later this week, so subscribe over there as well if you want to check that out. 
All right, if you're excited to see Ferrari, this is going to be a great behind the scenes introduction to the film. I've got movie magic with stunt coordinator Robert Nagel. And that's coming up right after this. This episode of Horsepower Heritage is sponsored by Model Citizen Diecast. No matter what's in your garage, you can fit all your automotive heroes on a shelf. And they've got you covered, whether it's 143rd scale, 118th scale, or even the ginormous 18th scale masterpieces from the Amalgam Collection. Go to ModelCitizenDieCast.com and get 10% off when you use the promo code HERITAGE at checkout. Limitations apply. From race cars to street cars and everything in between, it's Model Citizen Diecast. Because your inner child still wants to play with cars. Robert Nagel, stunt coordinator for the new Ferrari film. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. This should be fun. Robert, your resume is a mile long. You're an incredible stunt coordinator. Cars are your specialty, right, in Hollywood. Absolutely. And there's a reason for that. There is. Um, I come from the racing world, and cars have been part of my life since growing up. I've just been drawn to mechanical things and how fast can I make them go. Tell us a little bit about your racing background itself. I started off drag racing, learned how to make horsepower, get it to the ground, and got bored with it. <laughs> then moved on to road racing, and that really captivated me. So how did you transition from racing to stunting? So there's two ways to look at it. The funny answer is I ran out of money racing. Like everyone does. Yes. And so I started making the transition from racing to driving on camera, driving whether it's crashing the cars or driving at speed. But oftentimes I was hired to drive cars like what's behind us at speed and not wreck them because we can't crash them, but they want them driven close to the limit. So I was known to, to for that genre, if you will, to really take a performance car and run it at its limit for, for a show. In order to sell it on screen, you have to be at the limit, right? Have to be very close to the limit, but there's there's another side to that, and, and that is sometimes the way you drive the car, especially through a corner, might be slightly different than how you do it for a race line, um, just to get a little better perspective of what the car is doing, make it look better for camera. So there's nuances that we have to find to to make that look nice. Your number one job is to keep everybody safe. At the end of the day, absolutely. I have to design everything to mitigate as much risk as possible. Any particular challenges in that regard for this movie? This one was tough. I mean, if you look at the cars, they're open top. And that era, they didn't wear seatbelts. So I had to overcome that. My drivers all wore five-point harnesses, but they're, they're hidden by the wardrobe. Uh, we also had roll bars that were, were removable. So if we were doing anything precarious, we'd put the roll bars in. And then they'd digitally remove the roll bars. But oftentimes, we didn't have the roll bars in. When cars are running close together at high speed, there's always a chance that there could be a mechanical problem, a tire blows. You know, the fact that we had built these cars from the ground up and they were built by a, a team of guys that understand racing and understand how to keep cars going and, and how dangerous it can be if you don't stay on top of it. We were able to push these things really hard with confidence that they're going to stay together. And they were... They were looked after uh, at the end of the day front to back top to bottom they were gone through make sure everything was perfect so the next day we had basically a new car would you call ferrari your biggest project yet um i think so yeah it's you know it, it was a massive undertaking uh, michael had been trying to get this off the ground for over 20 years um, so to see it to finally coalesce and become a, a really tangible project um, was was really amazing the story of enzo ferrari as told by Michael Mann, starring Adam Driver and Penelope Cruz. I mean, A-list all the way, right? Yeah. I mean, they're, fan, yeah, they're top of their game. They're amazing, amazing talent. How did your prior work prepare you for this project? Having known this project and known Michael as long as I have kind of gave me, I think, a, a step up in being able to, to handle this and really work with Michael and get his vision on camera. And what was his vision? Go fast. Let's talk about the behind the scenes of the cast and crew and the cars. The cars are characters after all, right? Yes. They have this almost sense that they're alive in a way. Part of that feeling is you're dealing with a car that was literally hand-built from the ground up. 
the lines of that car and, and the shape and the curves, it just, I think it, it speaks for itself that, yeah, it's alive. They, they, they're every bit of a character as, as Adam is. Now, Adam isn't really in the action sequences, is he? I mean, because Enzo's not a driver. He's the engineer. Yeah, at this point, he, I mean, he's, he's way beyond uh, his driving years. And they don't really talk about their... But when he did race, he, he came to the realization there were guys that were much better than him at driving. But he was able to put together a package and race that package and be very successful. And that's what, that's what he focused on. The, the meat of the story uh, takes place in 1957 Italy. Um, Enzo is struggling to keep his business alive, struggling to keep his family together, um, and trying to figure out how to keep his name on the map and make it bigger because he's not making money. And so the, the, the absolute uh, crisis for him at that point becomes the Mila Milia. He has to win it. He knows he has to win it to keep his name at the top. And so it's a big push for him to, get, to keep that together, the race team together, his wife together, and life, and his business. The whole thing is just it's on the verge of crumbling. What is the Mila Milia? The Mila Milia is a thousand mile race. It's a loop through Italy. And you're running through country roads at this point. Sometimes well over 130, 140 miles an hour. If you look at these cars, the, the tires are only six inches wide. And these guys are running them flat out down these roads. As the stunt coordinator, you want to execute Michael's vision. How do you prepare your team for a project like this? The guys I bring in, um, I work with often. Not all of them, but most of them do come from a professional racing background and have transitioned into doing uh, car work on camera and have done it very, very well. So there's a bit of a shorthand that we, is understood between us when I'm explaining a, a choreography or a race scene and how we need to photograph it and kind of step them through that. Yeah, so it, it's having that core team always with me is really, really helpful. Once you find a team that you can really work with, you want to work with them over and over as much as possible um, because everybody's relying on each other each person has to be in a specific point in time and spot at any given moment because they're relying on the other guy to be at his spot in any given moment if that doesn't come together we have problems it's a dance isn't it it is it really is if we can't photograph it it's useless so you know, again it comes down to at a given point this is where the action needs to happen this is where the cameras are expecting it to happen and you want to see it there the angles are set everything's set up the camera operators are expecting it so everything has to fall together in, in those steps how often do you have to do multiple takes robert i like to say i'm usually getting it in the first one or two takes and if we're crashing stuff that's maybe all we have is one or two takes so it's it's paramount that I get the choreography down and the timing down and everybody do what needs to be done, including camera, to get that shot. Give us an idea of how you plan an action sequence with cars. You're going to laugh. <laughs> I use matchbox cars. That's perfect. That makes so we, total we sit sense. Down, we draw it all out and we set the cars and you're driving this car, you're driving that car, and we kind of step through it, uh, you know, uh, a beat at a time this car does this this car does that and once everybody has it down pat and it's it's a nice visual to be able to see it and you're looking at it from overhead of where everything should be and it, it works out really well that makes total sense it's three-dimensional easy for everyone to understand their role and then the big picture as well yes tell us about some of the drivers in this film some of these guys have worked for me on other films so Derek Hill who's the son of Phil Hill uh, has worked for me in a couple films. We had uh, Samuel Hubinet, the former uh, D champion, has worked for me in a couple films. Tony Hunt, who's a USAC champion, we've worked together on a lot of stuff. Jeff Bucknam, who also worked with me on Ford versus Ferrari, his father, Ronnie Bucknam, drove the gold GT40 that finished third in the 1966 Le Mans. His son came to work for me on Ferrari, and when we brought him out and I tested him, he was too good. What do you mean he was too good? He was too smooth. He hit every mark perfectly, very smooth driver, very accomplished. Um, and so I turned to my dear friend, Ben Collins, AKA the Stig, and I said, you need to go ruin him. <laughs> yeah, just we need to dirty it up a little bit. And Patrick Dempsey is also in the film, is he not? Dempsey is in the film, and he did just about all of his driving. You know, he raced for a number of years uh, for Porsche, and he did a phenomenal job. And he literally 
would show up when we were testing, and he looked like a kid in a candy store. He was just, he did an amazing job. A lot of times, films, I think, miss the mark because they are over-reliant on CGI. That's not true here, is it? Because you guys are doing as much as possible in actuality. That's always been my goal, is to do as much as we can on camera, physically do it. From Baby Driver to Ford Ferrari to this film, Ferrari. There is a world where CGI and practical stunts, if you will, there's a marriage there that's, that's viable. But the way it works is your subject matter needs to be real. The center focus has to be real. You can start manipulating the peripheral, kind of blend it a little bit, and then it works. But once you start manipulating your primary subject matter, your eye knows there's something not quite right, and you pick up on it. And for me, at least, it takes me out of the story. So if I can keep the audience engaged in that story, I think it's, it pays off in dividends. What's the most difficult part of your job? I think um, initially it's just really connecting with the director and understanding his vision and how he wants to shoot this and how, what he's expecting to see and then being able to deliver that, but also at the same time um, walk him through what's doable and what's not doable and how grounded in reality you want to stay. It seems like a lot of times there's a temptation to step out of the bounds of realism with cars. And there's certainly a place for that in some films. But when I think back on a movie like Ronin, for example, you really believe that. Ronin, yeah. One of my favorite car chases. Yeah, an amazing chase. The French Connection is believable. Yes. Bullet is believable. There are other films I won't mention that just they stretch the bounds, right? Do you ever find yourself riding that line? No. I I want it to be as as real as possible but I also want to push the boundaries and limits of people going oh my god I've never seen that or that was amazing for them to walk away with something like that that's that's my goal does realism have a limit in terms of what you do as a stunt coordinator yeah realism can have a limit and that goes back to what I said earlier sometimes we have to drive the car a little different sometimes we overdrive the car the body roll or the suspension compressing all of that moving or we'll overdrive the car and get that movement and get, you know, make the car act, if you will. Let's talk about some movie magic tricks. If we were to pull wide and watch a sequence, we'd see how the shot is accomplished, right? And it's a lot less dramatic when you realize there are camera cars and a lot of people around, a lot of crew around. In order to sell it, you've really got to hide what you're doing, don't you? Yeah, I mean, that is, as you put it, part of the movie magic. And one of the instruments that we utilize is this rig that I helped design uh, with uh, Alan Pedalford, and that's called the biscuit rig. And we can physically take a car like this and put it on the bed of this rig and run it at speed. And you will never know that it's not actually being driven. And that's how we fool you. And that thing is custom designed from the ground up, right? Yes, we, it's hand-built, engineered from the ground up. What are kind of some of the specs on the biscuit? So the one I use for, uh, we have three of them, but the one I mainly use, we call our, or I call it sort of the sports car version. Uh, It's 650 horsepower. It'll do 150 miles an hour uh, with a car on it. And as I like to jokingly say, it'll outrun most cars with a car on it. You can configure it for whatever particular shot you need, right? Yeah. So it's designed in a manner that the driving uh, pod, if you will, is movable around the platform. So depending on where the director wants to look, with camera, we then move the pod out of frame and we fool you every time. We can mount cameras anywhere on there. And oftentimes we have three or four cameras rolling at the same time. Um, you can almost, you know, not quite 360 degrees, you can pan a camera, probably 270 plus degrees to where you, you, you just, you don't know that you're not, you, you feel you're on the car. How do you accomplish the illusion of the car being on the ground because it is being carried by the biscuit. When we're doing really high performance stuff, typically we have what's called a car buck. And that is you have the shell of the car, there's no engine, there's no suspension. And we set it on the bed of the, uh, the biscuit rig and we're at ride height. So now you don't need to play with angles, you can have any other car up next to it and it's completely believable. Now the other camera car that's fascinating to me is the Porsche Cayenne. That's fun. Yeah, let's talk about that thing. So the, the, the Porsche Cayenne, it's a, it's a Cayenne turbo. 
Um, it's been modified. It's, I think it's around 700 horsepower. And we hang cameras on it, whether it be it's set up for a crane mount that we put on the roof and it swings around, or if it's really high speed, then we have a rig that mounts either on the front or the rear, and we can move the camera from ground level to about seven feet in the air on the move. And the advantage of that is it's not limited to the speed that we can with an arm that's mounted to the roof. On an arm car, you're limited about 60, 70 miles an hour. Um, with, the, with the rig that's independent of that and we take the crane off, we can do 100 plus miles an hour and chase race cars. It's movable on the, on the fly. So we can, we can come up to a car with it at ground level and then raise it up and look over the car and literally be just right, right on the vehicle. Where does the camera operator sit? So for that setup, the camera operator would sit in the front passenger seat. So he's got full view, but he's also got a big monitor, and that's really what he's looking at is the big monitor. How much did drones come into play for Ferrari? We used the drones quite a bit. They were very, very useful in the settings we were at. Uh, we needed to get shots off quickly. Sometimes uh, there wasn't a lot of room to fit anything else. And so I think we got some really cool stuff with drones uh, in this film. And were all the driving sequences shot in Italy on location? 100% all the, everything we shot was in Italy. The majority of what we shot was actually all around the outskirts of Modena. There were some fantastic country roads that we found. And each had, a, you know, depending on where you went, had a little different look. Some of them were sort of mountainous, some of them were flat. You'll see in the film, it's just to die for, some of the scenery. These cars are priceless. You're going to have to use the real thing in some scenes, but inevitably they're too valuable to drive close to the limit. So talk about using the real cars versus replicas in the film. The Mila Amelia cars that you're going to see, the open top cars, we hand built all those cars um, because the real version of it is 30, 40, 50 million dollars a copy. We did have a couple of real ones. The TDF that's in the Mila Amelia was a, it's a real Ferrari that we borrowed from a, a gentleman in the UK. And then for the F1 cars, we had two Maserati 250Fs that were real Maserati 250Fs. And then we, in, the, in that same genre, we reproduced two Ferrari 801s, and they don't exist, but we reproduced two of them and, again, built them from the ground up. Were you involved in actually making the replicas? I was very involved in that. And that was, I was tasked to help find a constructor for the chassis and work with a constructor for the bodywork. There were two separate uh, builders. And we wound up building the chassis in the UK and then bringing them to Italy. And once we're in Italy, uh, they built the bodies. And some were fiberglass and some were aluminum, depending on what we were going to do with the car. If we were going to make contact or crash them, they were aluminum. Yeah, because you want that to look real on camera as well. Yeah. It, it looks real because it is real. 100%. What kind of support did Ferrari give to the film? So Ferrari was super helpful. Um, they, they have a historian there, and he was helpful in uh, rec helping us recreate the Mila Milia. The little details about the cars. We were able to see the actual build sheets from some of the, the cars, the real cars. So there was a, really a, a massive wealth of information uh, available to us from Ferrari. Inevitably, historical accuracy and artistic license will clash. Yeah, there's always a bit of artistic license because um, sometimes the truth is boring. <laughs> so sometimes we have to spice it up a little bit or sometimes you just have to tell it in a different manner so the story has a little more flow to it. And I think a lot of people don't, don't understand that and it, it's aggravating to them when they say, well, that never really happened. But the one that stands out to me as an example is Carol Shelby and Ken Miles having a fist fight in Ford yes, versus Fry. Yeah, that never happened. Yeah, and I'm sure you hear about it all the time. Yeah, I know uh, it was brought up. I think Christian brought it up with somebody, and they're like, yeah, that, that wouldn't have happened. Yeah. But dramatically, it's funny. Right, right. Yeah, it was very entertaining. Robert, were you able to develop any new techniques or procedures for stunt work on this film? I'm always learning, you know, especially with... The, working with different directors and getting different perspectives. So I can't tell you specifically what I've learned, but yeah, there's I always walk away from each project learning something different and, and always trying to better myself in that way. By the way, did you go to the LA premiere? I did go to the LA premiere. Just yeah. How amazing. was it? Amazing. First time I've seen the film in its entirety. I've seen pieces of it. Um, so it was really nice to see it complete. It's really, really good film. Did you kind of sit back and, and kind of take stock on the audience and see how they were responding to the movie? They responded. 
and you'll know what I mean when you see it. Yeah, <laughs> there's there's a couple breathtaking moments. Incredible. By the way, I noticed the screenwriting credit went to Troy Kennedy Martin, who passed away in 2009, but he was the screenwriter for the original Italian job in 1969. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, pretty neat. And, and that's a, that film is a favorite of mine. Yes. And the stunt sequences in that film have to be inspirational to you. There's some good pieces in there, yeah. It's yeah, really good. really good stuff. So there have been a lot of really memorable stunt sequences involving cars over the years, but is there any particular stunt coordinator that was inspirational to you? I would have to say Hal Needham, Smokey and the Bandit. I mean, he came up with some ideas. Uh, he was very creative. Interesting thing about Smokey and the Bandit, I think it was basically shot on a shoestring budget, maybe like $9 million, and it was the top-grossing film of the year. Yeah, it did very well. Yeah. Uh, I don't think he had much money to go into it, and I think he begged, borrowed, and steal to make it happen, but crushed it. Ferrari, directed by Michael Mann, opens Christmas Day. Robert Nagel, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. That's all for this episode of Horsepower Heritage. I'm going to take some time off, but look for an episode from the vault on Wednesday, January 3rd. And I'll be back with an all-new episode on Wednesday, January 17th. Support the show at buymeacoffee.com forward slash hpheritage. Share this episode with your friends. Find me on Instagram and YouTube at Horsepower Heritage. And until next time, I'm Maurice Merrick. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.